Well, hi everyone, and welcome to lecture 13 of Physics 3113, Thermal Physics and Statistical Mechanics. I hope you're all doing okay out there and uh, doing all right with the assignment and your other assignments and all the remote lectures. In today's lecture, we will discuss mostly harmonic oscillators and how they relate to photons. Um, so we'll talk about quantum mechanics for the harmonic oscillator. You've probably seen this before in your quantum class, but if not, uh, I'll go over this again in a maybe convenient form. And then uh, we'll do the partition function for the harmonic oscillator and calculate the usual things that we calculate and get an idea of, of those. And then we'll finish up with the introduction to radiation loss for black body or so-called cavity radiation. And then in the next lecture, we'll discuss um, uh, black body and cavity radiation and the Planck distribution and so forth. But I just wanted to give you a really good um, introduction to harmonic oscillators um, to begin with. And in, in some ways, what we do today is um, almost an easier version, as you'll see, of um, bosons. Uh, and we'll, we'll discuss that relation. So we could have done this actually first, but maybe now that we've, in, in perspective with fermions and Bose-Einstein distributions and so forth, it might make more sense. Okay. All right, well, let's consider first the well-known harmonic oscillator, and probably the simplest example that you're familiar with is a mass on a spring. And so um, you know probably that the Hamiltonian of a sort of mass spring type of harmonic oscillator uh, looks like this. It has two terms, p squared over 2m uh, and m omega squared over 2 times uh, um, x hat squared. So we'll, we'll, we'll think in terms of quantum mechanics where the p's and x's are harmonic oscillators and um, I've written this uh, writing k here as m omega squared where omega of course will be the angular frequency as you uh, are usually familiar with. And if we're doing quantum mechanics, like I said, these are operators and these operators obey this uh, commutation relation. And sometimes you hear the harmonic oscillator call, uh, called a linear oscillator because the restoring force is linear. And, um, and, and, per, and this makes, you know, it's equivalent to say it's a harmonic oscillator because if the restoring force, for example, were nonlinear, you would have what's called an anharmonic oscillator. And what we'll see, uh, and maybe you've already seen in your quantum class, is that with a harmonic oscillator you get a series of equidistant energy levels, um, if the restoring force were nonlinear, you would get um, not non-equidistant energy levels, uh, and they would, that's what it's that's known as the anharmonic oscillator. But we're we're only going to consider here the uh, harmonic oscillator, which is again linear in the restoring force. Okay, so you've probably seen that before. Um, what you may haven't seen before, though, is another type of well-known harmonic oscillator. Probably you saw this in um, circuits if you ever took a class on circuit theory. And another well-known harmonic oscillator, of course, is the um, so-called LC circuit. Basically, you have a, an inductor L um, connected to a capacitor. And you look at the charge on the capacitor, and if you remember, that it, it classically, it behaves um, very much like a mass on the spring. Well, the interesting thing is you can quantize uh, the harmonic, this, uh, sorry, LC circuit as an oscillator, as an electromagnetic oscillator, and you can actually write a Hamiltonian for this kind of circuit. And, and um, in my field of research, where I study the quantum physics of superconducting circuits, this is, uh, this is a, something we do quite regularly and, and sort of the starting point for analyzing uh, the quantum physics of small circuits. But anyway, you write a Hamiltonian, and it's very similar. You have these two terms, uh, one that goes like the charge on the capacitor squared divided by 2C, and the other term, like the flux through the inductor squared over 2L. And, I mean, if you want to make an analogy, you could say, well, this is like momentum and this is like position. If you want, you could call this position and this momentum. It doesn't matter because they're, they're charge and flux. But the point is, you have precisely the same form um, of this type of harmonic oscillator that you did for the mechanical oscillator. And here, 
and, and, and of course there's nothing particularly quantum mechanical about this except the fact that I have operators here and when I do quantize the system that's what happens is the charge on the capacitor is an, is a, is an operator like momentum and the flux through the inductor becomes an operator uh, like position here and um, you find that these operators also obey commutation relations very similar to, to these of course and so you, most of the, this lecture will be interested in um, this sort of electromagnetic oscillators rather than the mechanical ones. Uh, and lectures at the end of this week will talk about phonons, which are basically similar to the mechanical oscillator. It's the positions of ions in a solid. So anyway, we have this Hamiltonian that's quadratic in, in, in two terms. So it has two degrees of freedom, two quadratic degrees of freedom. And uh, we'll want to uh, do the quantum mechanics for this. Uh, just as an aside that you might be interested in, if it, there's nothing wrong with writing the Hamiltonian in terms of uh, this charge and this flux, but um, in what's known as circuit quantum electrodynamics, usually with superconducting circuits, the kind of um, physics that's involved in, for example, types of qubits that Google and Microsoft and, and IBM and are, uh, are working on, um, we usually we like to normalize these variables, so we usually normal, normalize charge in units of 2e because it's in a superconductor, and we usually normalize the flux to the inductor in terms of this so-called flux quantum, uh, phi naught. It's just a, a particular value of the flux. It has some really interesting significance in um, especially superconducting physics, but but it's convenient to write um, the harmonic oscillator and these normalized variables because then you get a, a commutation relation here that it's just, uh, uh, it, we've, we've sort of absorbed Planck's constant into the normalization of the, of, the, um, of the flux. And it allows you to write the Hamiltonian in a, in a very easy way here, um, that uh, the charge term just is multiplied by a, a characteristic energy, we call it the charging energy, and the the flux is then multiplied, you can see just this dimensionless variable uh, by the so-called inductive energy. And those, these are what these energies are. It's just a, a convenient way to write it. And, and of course, I, I've, I've dropped the hats here because I'm, I'm kind of know, I kind of you know, know that I'm talking about oscillators. So if I, if I know that I'm, you know, what's an operator, I can sort of not worry about putting hats everywhere and making it a little bit more simple. Okay, so anyway, we, we have this harmonic oscillator. We haven't really said anything about it. It's just, it involves the two variables uh, and the Hamiltonian's quadratic in these two variables. That, that's all. Well, how do we, how do we uh, deal with this oscillator? Well, um, you know, you can write the Hamiltonian in terms of, of scaled variables or in terms of momentum and position or in terms of charge and flux. But um, rather than work out and so probably, you know, when you had this in quantum physics, you probably actually worked in position and momentum, uh, and you worked out the, um, the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions in position rep representation. If you remember Dirac notation, you would write, then that means you would write a wave function. You would solve for the eigenvalues, and we, we, will, we will index them by n here. Um, uh, sorry, not to be confused with my dimensionless variable. This is n is some integer number. Usually we start with zero with the harmonic oscillator and then excited states one, two, three, anyway. Um, but um, we're not going to be really interested too much in the actual wave functions here um, for what we need to describe, so um, at least not at the beginning. So we really only need energy eigenvalues, uh, especially when we do the canonical, and canonical ensemble. So um, it pays to transform this Hamiltonian. This is well e either one of these, uh, but let's let's think of let's think in terms of just to make life simple. Let's think in terms of the mechanical harmonic oscillator where we have momentum and position. So it pays to work instead um, in um, instead of using the operators x hat and p hat. It um, it is really a lot much easier to work in terms of another set of operators. We call them a and a plus. Um, 
And they're basically just a linear transformation uh, of the operators x hat and p hat. What do I mean by that? Well, you see a here is a is um, involves uh, a combination of x hat and p hat, and so does a dagger. And of course, they're complex conjugates of each other because the sign it's just the sign that changes here. And and also, we're going to drop the hat notation for these operators because we we kind of know their operators. Okay. Anyway, this is just a linear transformation. That is, I could write this as my raising and lowering operators is what we'll call them, um, th these operators. It's just a matrix times um, our x hat and p hat. And that matrix, just by examination, you can see that matrix look like this. And by writing it this way, you know, we can always invert that. So if we wanted, you know, we can always get back to x hat and p hat just by multiply, multiplying by the inverse of this matrix, right? So we can go back and forth, um, and uh, and so you can see that I've solved here for here I had the a and a plus uh, in terms of x hat and p hat, and now I've just inverted this, and I so I could solve this the other way around, and you see that basically x hat is the uh, sum of a plus a, uh, sorry a plus a. We'll maybe call this a dagger. This is this a plus a dagger, and uh, p hat's just a similar thing, a slightly different constant in front in I and the difference. And this is a very common way of treating harmonic oscillators. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you've seen it before, but uh, if you if you have good, if you haven't seen it, well, you'll you, you should get used to this because you'll use it a lot um, if you stay and take higher higher level physics courses. So the point of all this is okay. This is just a transformation. So now we can write our Hamiltonian. Oh yeah, first we need to note that since x hat and p hat obey a commutation relation, if you plug in a and a dagger here uh, for um, what what their their values were here and do the algebra a bit, you'll find that um, you can actually write the Hamiltonian of the harmonic oscillator in a very simple form. It just looks like this: h bar omega, where this is the angular frequency, so this is a, an energy. Uh, times um, a dagger a plus one half, and and so you see it looks instead of having squares of oper operators, we have just this product um, a dagger a, and when you do this type, when you write the Hamiltonian like this, there's a, what's called normal order, and that means we always put all the uh, the a operators to the right and the a dagger operators to the left. Uh, you don't have to, but it's just a kind of convention that makes uh, further calculation uh, easy. Okay, so there we go. That's our Hamiltonian, and we did this with you know x, x hat and p hat. We could have done this with our charge and flux if we wanted the same kind of linear transformation, and we'd have the same thing. We'd have a Hamiltonian for our electrical oscillator that looks just like that. And so it's pretty easy to show then. Uh, you don't even have to solve for the, the wave function. It's pretty easy to show that the eigenvalues of this, this operator, which is the product of a dagger a, uh, are non-negative integers, including zero. And so we can, we, can don't, that we can denote the eigenstates of this a dagger a. It's also called, so called the number operator because um, the eigenstates are these, uh, these integer states 0, 1, and 2. And this just represents, if you've done the harmonic oscillator uh, sort of in position and momentum, uh, you've, you've got equally spaced levels, and you could label them as 0, 1, and 2. And so that, that's just what this is. So it's, it's a very easy way of doing this. Or So we'll call the eigenstates, we'll label them by this index n. And you see that you can also see that they're equally spaced levels too, because this operator operating on 0 will give you 0, and this operator operating on the 1 will give you a 1, and so forth. So, so this A dagger A gives the number of, let's say, quantized excitations in the oscillator. And so the allowed energies, of course, will just be n plus 1 half, we have this 1 half term, uh, times h bar omega. So we can think of our oscillator levels as you know, starting with the zero, which has no excitations, and then the next higher energy level at h bar omega. Uh, well, so so the 
when n equals zero, we, we've we've chosen a sort of scale of the energy so that the ground state at zero has h bar omega over two energy, and and so forth. So, and you see, so we have these this set of equally spaced energy levels that describe our harmonic oscillator. But unlike spins, this end is not bounded from above. And we like spins, we would start and we'd have just, you know, if we had spin j, we'd have 2j plus 1 um, uh, numbers of states. But here, there's no, there's no bound on how big n can be, right? It is really is like a harmonic, it is a harmonic oscillator. So now that we have our energy levels, um, we can, it's very easy to uh, work out the canonical ensemble. So let's just do this for one oscillator with a particular angular frequency omega. And you see that you, well, you just use the usual rules for writing down the, the canonical ensemble and the canonical partition function. For we'll, we'll put the one here to remind us it's one oscillator. We just have to sum over all the, the configurations, which here are labeled by uh, this n, and their energy here, okay? So that's it, that's the partition function for our um, harmonic oscillator. Now, if we wanted, you see, we could pull out, each term here has a factor, uh, beta h bar omega over two, so we could pull that out here, well, the negative sign, we could pull that out of the sum, uh, since it doesn't depend upon n, and we would have this, right? And, well, you see, we could have taken the energies to be measured from this h bar omega over 2. And this h bar omega over 2 is called the zero point energy. Uh, and, it, and if we did that, we would get this, we would get our partition function to look like this. Just, just go back and redo this, and you'll see that. So, I mean, you could see that this is okay because, I mean, we could take this to be our partition function. We could take either one. Right, and and that's because you see, whenever we calculate anything like probabilities or or mean values, we'd have terms, uh, we'd have this factor in the numerator, and it would get canceled by this factor in the denominator. So, I mean, this just shows explicitly that we can we can choose the zero of our energy um, when we when we're doing uh, statistical mechanics with the canonical um, ensemble. So we can work with either one, and we'll kind of you know we'll, we'll see. We'll see it's, in some ways, it's more advantageous to work with this one because when we look at this, we'll say, oh, wow, that, that looks like something we've seen before. So now if you go back to previous lecture, you'll see that this looks just like the Bose-Einstein partition function. Um, in, in, in particular, the grand uh, sum, or grand partition function, for a single level, when we only have one bosonic level, uh, energy epsilon of h bar omega, but with we've sort of we've have the chemical potential equal to zero, so that's that's what we recognize. So remember when we did bosons, if there was one level, it could be occupied with some number of bosons, and uh, we got this sum here. If we had uh, we usually had the chemical potential as well, so here we have sort of a special case of this, and. In fact, that's what's kind of you know what what's really happening. We can what this means is we can interpret the harmonic the quantum harmonic oscillator as a as kind of bosonic level where we can have any number n of let's say excitations present. So it's a completely valid picture that our harmonic oscillator is like bosons where we instead of levels we think of the levels as corresponding to either zero or one, two, three, up to you know whatever number of excitations are in the system. And that's kind of interesting, right? So for, for electromagnetic modes, well, harmonic oscillators, but you will see that if you have electro, electromagnetic modes in a cavity, they behave like harmonic oscillators, um, and, and that means that they are photons, right? Where, whereas these excitations uh, for mechanical modes will be phonons. We'll, we'll talk about this later. Uh, well, this week, next week, the last two lectures of the uh, of the course. Okay, well, I hope I hope that's clear. So now, of course, we did this before. We recognize this series as an infinite series, and um, and and of course, we can sum that. 
um, and, and we find, of course, that the partition function is this uh, 1 over 1 minus e to the minus beta h bar omega, which is also the partition function we found for a single bosonic level that had energy epsilon. Uh, here, the epsilon would be equal to h bar omega, and where we have zero chemical potential again. All right? Are you with me so far? Good. But let, just for fun, let's just go back to this form uh, of the partition function. Uh, and, and we can sum that as well. Uh, well, it's just this sum, and we multiply back by this term again. Let's see. That, well, we could write it, if we wanted to, we could write this in this form if we want, because, you know, in the end, we take derivatives with uh, respect to the logarithm of the partition function. So let's work with this form and see, see what we get now. So, well, we can also uh, find the Helmholtz potential because uh, we, we, we just we remember, I don't know why I have two f's here, f equals f, <laughs> of course. F, f is uh, uh, minus uh, K, kBT, uh, sorry, I left out my Boltzmann thing there, kBT log of the partition function. And, uh, and we can just plug that back in if we want. Um, this term and, and we'll see it's equal to uh, uh, this, right? So, um, and of course now we could calculate the average energy in the oscillator. Remember we had this relation before for finding the mean energy um, and or we can write in terms of the Helmholtz potential if we want and, and just Going through the algebra here, we I've just gone through a th few steps. You see that you get uh, well. This is what we would have had before, plus this one half again, because we've we've as we said we've used this form where we've taken this, the the energy we, we've we've measured the in, we've taken the zero of the energy such that the ground state has h bar omega over two, right? This is the zero point energy. So. Let's look at this again then. Uh, yeah, so this, of course, we recognize this looks like uh, the so-called um, the occupation, uh, mean occupation number of bosons with zero chemical potential plus this one-half term, right? So it looks like what we had before for the Bose-Einstein distribution but with chemical potential equal to zero plus this one-half term, of course, right? Well, that's probably obvious. Um, Let's look at this derivative again. Let's look at uh, this one. So if we work this out, we see we get this mean occupation number for our bosons plus the one-half term. So um, by choosing the energy the way we did, where we explicitly have some zero-point energy, um, we this equals we get this extra term here. Of course, remember before when we worked with bosons, we took the zero of energy to be um, the ground state had zero energy uh, or and so of course we had this just to equal we had or we could turn around we could say the mean occupation number was this derivative of one over beta minus one over beta times a partial of log z1 with respect to epsilon right so just by choosing the energy differently we get that it's, it's no big deal we can like I said we can work with it or we, we, we can yeah, so so it's just to be aware that if we if we include the zero point energy, uh, we have to put this other term here when we go to calculate this. But a lot of time, but we don't have to. We can we can we can work where the ground state is defined is we take the zero energy with the ground state and and this won't be a problem. I just wanted to point it out. Um, let's just calculate this by the way then, for we, since we found this just to see how it works, and we'll substitute in. Um, the, this log of the partition function. And I've just gone through all the steps here so you can see what's going on. Nothing fancy, it's just a few algebraic steps. And of course, what we find is, um, yep, exactly what we had. This is the, this is the uh, um, you know, basically it's the Bose-Einstein distribution function or the mean occupation number. Um, with, of course, zero chemical potential. So, I mean, I, we were going around a bit uh, just to have a look at things from different perspectives, but as I said 
a few slides ago, we can think of the excitations of a of a harmonic oscillator. Well, harmonic oscillator is linear, so maybe that's a little bit of redundancy. But excitations of harmonic oscillators are are bosons, and but they have chemical potential. Um, well, you can think of it as chemical potential equal to zero. Um, in fact, it's really what you're saying is that the chemical potential is is undefined, right? I mean, so if you remember when we looked at fermions and and bosons with we, and we, we had to work out the chemical what the chemical potential by this constraint by fixing the mean total number of particles, right? And so what this is telling us is that, well, we can think of mu equals zero, but we can just, you know, what it's saying is that the number of excitations is not at all constrained for this type of pho what we're going to see are phot photons or phonons or basically excit excitations of harmonic oscillators. So you could say the potential, the chemical potential is zero, but really it's it's just not defined because there's, there's no constraint on n, mean n, basically. And so it's actually quite simple then. So, and, and once again, so photons uh, are, are excitations of modes of the electromagnetic field. And, and so typically when you quantize the electromagnetic field, and, and I realize you probably won't get to actually doing this until probably honors physics, but when you actually just start to discuss the electromagnetic field as quantum mechanical, uh, then you usually do this by putting it in a box and looking at the modes and solving for the boundary conditions. You'll find that basically, like that LC uh, oscillator I started with, that in a in a cavity or in a box. Uh, photons are really just excitations of, um, they're, they're completely equivalent to a, a collection of harmonic oscillators, and, and the photons are the excitations. And you also see then, we'll see next week that in a similar manner that phonons are ex excitations of uh, mechanical oscillator systems. And in particular, um, phonons are usually thought about of, of, as, as uh, displacement of ions in a solid. So the solid, the ions sort of have a have a, a mean location or equilibrium position, and of course uh, they can move around, but they're constrained by the restoring forces of the other ions. And phonons, uh, are in, in a similar way to photons, are basically the excitations of these m sort of mechanical modes. Okay. Well, let's uh, have a look at the mean or average energy the oscillator. We already calculated this, right? And, uh, and we calculated where we explicitly uh, uh, included the, the zero point uh, energy here, this one h bar omega over two. And so if we actually calculate that, uh, we get this, um, which, well, we already did calculate. This is just the mean occupation number n, little small n, and this is the, um, um, the, um, the, the, zero point uh, energy term. Uh, this of course can be written in this form if you just do a little bit of algebra uh, and it makes it a little bit easier to work with. So basically writing it in terms of, uh, of kVt this way. And if you plot that then, here I'm going to plot this, the mean energy of, remember we're only talking about one oscillator, as a function of kVt uh, divided by the energy scale of the oscillator, which is of course h bar omega, so this is sort of a dimensionless unit, and we just plot this function, and of course what this function here does is this blue line, uh, it kind of saturates here at of course uh, h bar omega over 2, right? Um, sorry, this, I, I, this is actually scaled by uh, um, h bar omega. I didn't, I didn't write the mean energy, I'm actually scaling in this plot by h bar omega. So it, so it goes to one half, uh, and then as we raise the temperature, uh, it it kind of starts going up, and then it and it approaches this line, which is just basically uh, h bar omega over two. So when this becomes one, mean energy. Sorry, uh, not when this becomes one. If you if you expand um, this term, you'll see that it, it goes essentially like. Uh, KT, half KT over H bar omega, basically. 
So I guess so. So this is this, and this is four. Then that's two, right? That's just this function here. So, well, that's the the mean energy. What about the heat capacity? Well, the heat capacity is the derivative of the mean energy with respect to temperature, and um, and here I'm I'm going to conclude the uh, heat capacity holding the volume constant, even though we're talking about one oscillator here. Um, we'll think uh, the reason why I'm going to keep writing the the, the V here is that the in a either a photon or um, um, a mechanical mode, this usually depends upon the length of the box that you have it in, right? And so, uh, so basically, we're going to imagine that this is the heat capacity per oscillator when we keep this h bar omega constant. So we're not varying h bar omega because we're not changing the size of the box, which would change the the the, uh, the fundamental frequency of the oscillator. So that's that's what that means. Well, anyway, let's just work it out. We can, we can, we can work. We can take this derivative and and uh, simplify it uh, until we get this form, and you'll see. Well, of course, it's just the the derivative of this with respect to temperature. So you you can see it's going to uh, be zero and then build up to some constant value, right? That, that's exactly what it does. But the interesting thing to, to look at, and here I've also written KBT over the, uh, the temperature scale uh, is scaled by h bar omega, and but I've scaled um, the heat capacity by Boltzmann constant divided by two because I'm already thinking in terms of the equipartition theorem. Remember, we had the equipartition theorem, and it said that classically uh, the, the heat capacity would would be um, uh, one half, well, the energy would be one half uh, kBT, right, uh, per degree of freedom, and so the heat capacity is, is would be sort of k over two for each degree of freedom, and so what this shows you is that large high temperatures in the so-called classical limit, there are you know two degrees of freedom, right, which is just the equal, classical equipartition theorem, and 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 that corresponds. Uh, to in a harmonic oscillator, remember we had two terms in the Hamiltonian, two quadratic terms, position and momentum. And if you go back, I had some extra notes on equal partition theorem, which um, specifically says the the, the the degrees of freedom are defined of, as quadratic, where your energies are quadratic and variables. And here we had position and momentum, or in the LC oscillator we had charge and flux. And that's why classically uh, this this value goes to well, k or two units of k over two, right? So that's kind of what we expect, and you know what this is saying is that um, the the energy is just freezing out at uh, low temperature. So the so you know as we go to very low temperature, we only have the ground only the ground state is being occupied. Okay. All righty. Then I just wanted to show that um, we can expand um, this for this expression uh, for large T, or really. When uh, h bar omega uh, divided by kBT is much much less than one, in other words, kBT is much much larger than h bar omega. Then you, of course, you can expand the exponential, and if you expand the exponential in this, uh, you'll find that uh, just as we argued, uh, you get uh, this form uh, for the heat capacity. And when temperature goes gets very very when this gets very very small, then it, of course it's just k at two degrees. Two degrees of freedom. This is just showing um, the math of this part of the of the plot of the heat capacity. That's all. Okay, so that's that's pretty much it for the harmonic oscillator from levels to partition function uh, to mean energy and heat capacity.
Oh, but there there is just uh, one thing I, I kind of want to point out. If if we go go back to this mean energy, we see that extremely low temperatures, the energy saturates to this one half. And that means, uh, of course, we had this form for the energy. Where was that? Uh, of course. So what we're saying is that the mean number is going to zero, right? And that's what's quite different than than. Um, let's go back to here. That's what's very different than bosons, uh, where we have Bose-Einstein condensation. So Bose-Einstein condensation arose because um, we had this constraint. We wanted to, we 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 could constrain our system, you know, physically with a trap or particles in a box. We could constrain our system to be some total number, some mean total number that, as we got to a large system, had very small fluctuations. And so the chemical potential w was very, very close to zero and negative, as we argued, but it wasn't zero, or it wasn't undefined. And so even um, at very, very low temperatures in, 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 a, a, in a, the ideal bosonic gas, we still have a large number of particles, and they get into the ground state, uh, which if there's a state near zero. And um, here, the, the state, first of all, there's no state so, so from this excitation picture of that their photons are bosons, you know, the the first excitation is at h bar omega, and and the state uh, is at zero energy, but, well, or one half uh, h bar omega over two, if we consider the zero point energy, that corresponds to no excitations, and that's what I was trying to say that the chemical potential really is not defined here. I mean, you can think of it as zero, but it's it just says that the ground state of of this gas of photons there is no excitations present because there's no constraint on numbers. So so that's the fundamental difference um, between um, photons, uh, phonons, um, and uh, and let's say an ideal gas of bosons where we actually try to fix we can fix the number. Okay, so well, that was you know getting used to oscillators and viewing the excitations as photons, and so now uh, with that in mind, we can actually um, go on to discuss uh, a gas of uh, a, 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 what some people call the ideal Planck gas, which is a gas of photons, and then we'll talk about a gas of phonons. But um, and so this comes up um, in, in the, the topic of a gas of uh, photons, it's also known as black body or cavity radiation. And so, um, you know, all objects uh, with that have a, a temperature, you know, that's above absolute zero, of course, you can't actually get to zero, you can get very close, but any object we find emits energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation. And so, what's known as a black body is a Theor theoretical or kind of model system, and and it, so it, it it the reason it's called a black body is because it absorbs all the radiation that's falling on it, and and it doesn't reflect or transmit anything, so it's a perfect absorber, and of course it's also a perfect emitter of radiation at all wavelengths, and um, the spectral distribution of the thermal energy rated by radiated by a black body is found to depend only on the temperature. So, you know, think of the, when you're sitting around a fire in the middle of time and you have, you, you, you have this fire poker in the fire and if it's, it's kind of hot, it's red hot, but if it's really, really hot, it's white hot. And that, that color is sort of telling you where the, it, it's really the peak in the so-called spectrum. We'll see that a black body spectrum is peaked. And, and so, um, but there's radiation at all, all frequencies, of course. And it's a very, very interesting problem because, as you might have known from the history of quantum physics, understanding this dis spectral distribution of, of um, uh, the so-called black body spectral distribution of thermal energy rated by black body and its temperature dependence, you know, was quite confounding when, when um, people like Planck and Einstein and other people tried to work out classically, like from a classical model of 
electromagnetic modes as classical electrical oscillators, and they just couldn't get this correct. And then Planck said, well, maybe you know the photons are, are quantized, or the electromagnetic modes are harmonic oscillator modes, uh, but they're quantized somehow. And that was how you know this whole quantum thing got started out. So anyway, um, I'm going to just introduce black body or cavity radiation in the next couple of slides, and then we'll pick back up we'll, uh, in the next lecture uh, and work out the so-called Planck distribution. But everything, uh, you know, it, black bodies are, are ideal systems that radiate, uh, and the distribution of the of the the sort of frequency distribution, the spectral distribution depends on the temperature. But uh, even you know the universe itself emits so-called black body radiation, and this is known as the cosmic microwave background uh, because it's peaked at um, at um, microwave frequencies. Um, by the way, you can always uh, express um, the, uh, you know you can think about the temperature of a black body or its peak and its its radiation, but um, uh, this so-called cosmic um, microwave background radiation, it comes from early in the early universe when matter and energy decoupled and all of a sudden the universe became very transparent. And, um, uh, and so, so when the universe curled enough, protons and electrons could basically combine to form hydrogen and all of a sudden the universe was transparent to all this electromagnetic radiation, which it wasn't before. And so what we see in the cosmic microwave background is the remnant of this of this phase of the universe, and the cosmic microwave background has a has a temperature which describes where its peak in the distribution is. We'll see it in a minute, and this temperature is basically 2.72548 uh, plus or minus this, and and this really is significant figures. I mean, this can be measured so accurately that th it really is this many significant figures, and the reason why uh, it, it well. It, People have gone to great extremes to measure it precisely because there are small fluctuations in the background temperature, and this tells us a lot about the early universe and how it formed. So this temperature corresponds to a peak frequency of 160.23 gigahertz, by the way. So it's it's up in the submillimeter, nearly submillimeter microwave, nearly well, not quite submillimeter would be terahertz. It's not quite terahertz, but it's up up in the microwave frequency, quite high. So uh, you know your your Wi-Fi um, uh, 5G, I guess, is um, I think 5.7 gigahertz. You can see it's quite quite a bit higher. Well, anyway, we'll go through the details of cavity uh, black ba black body radiation, but um, just for this introduction, we'll just summarize um, the results in terms of several laws, and and some of these you've probably encountered before. So, but I just wanted to. Um, you know, give you a preview of those. The first, of course, is called Planck's Law, uh, Planck's Law of Black Body Radiation, which is a formula that uh, determines the spectral energy density of the emission at each frequency nu at a particular temperature T. So I have a black body, um, an ideal um, object absorber emitter that's sitting at a particular temperature T, and it will have this spectral distribution in terms of the frequency and the temperature. And so you can, you can, and it has this particular form, and you may have seen this before, but you, just by looking at this equation, uh, you can see that at small frequency, uh, well, small frequency, this term um, is, uh, um, this term is going to be large, well, this term is going to go like uh, new to the third power, and then it's going to be cut off when this term uh, becomes. Um, very large. So it'll have a peak somewhere, right? We'll see exactly the form of that. Um, and there's also what's called Wien's displacement law, and it just says that the frequency of the peak in the spectrum, um, we'll call that nu max, increases linear with the absolute temperature T. So the peak in the spectrum is going to be proportional uh, to the temperature. That's Wien's displacement law. And finally, of course, you've heard of the uh, Stefan Boltzmann law, which uh, relates the total energy emitted, we call it E, to the absolute temperature. It basically says the total energy emitted goes like the fourth power of the temperature. So we'll work all these out in detail.
uh, using statistical mechanics and, um, and what we've learned about photons. So, um, some, some, by the way, some typical black body radiation curves I found here. And uh, just one thing, some, some people like to measure black body spectra in wavelengths, and some people, like I had in frequency, uh, you can use uh, frequency or wavelength, um, of course, depending on your point of view. Oh, I guess uh, that reminds me of a really corny physics joke. So um, I'll tell you the corny physics joke. So, uh, uh, so Phil, this physicist, Phil, walks into a bar, and he sees his buddy Bob at the bar, and uh, you know who's also a physicist, and he says, "Hey, Bob, what's new?" And Bob says, "C over lambda. What else?" Ah, uh, yeah, okay, pretty corny. But um, so here's this is a black body spectral distribution where it's been plotted in terms of wavelength, you know. So basically, uh, yeah, <laughs> instead of frequency, uh, new. And, um, and, and here's a one that comes from the COBE experiment, the cosmic uh, background radiation measurement of a, a particular satellite. Uh, here, they're plotting it in frequency in some you know, unit, units that are related to wavelengths. So people have certain funny ways of doing it. But you can see it pr particularly this is the Planck distribution here. And this is this peak. And Wien's law tells us how that peak shifts with temperature. And what I was saying about back here about the fact that uh, this temperature is actually measured um, uh, of, of this uh, uh, cosmic background radiation to this many significant figures, uh, it, indeed it is. And, and what this map is is the um, small deviations in this temperature as we look out uh, at the universe. And so a lot of people are very interested in small deviations um, because they tell us a lot about the early universe and theories of uh, how the universe was created. Okay, so uh, so we'll go into details next lecture, but basically, you know, there are these two approaches that we've sort of skirted on. One was to consider normal modes of electromagnetic waves in a cavity, um, and of course we showed that radiation is can, can, can be considered as a gas of photons obey Bose-Einstein statistics um, with zero chemical potential essentially, and which is we'll sort of follow this uh, basically. And so what we mean by a cavity is a nearly ideal black body. Well we'll consider it to be ideal and there are many many modes of oscillation. So uh, we'll come back to this in the next lecture but we'll start with I'll just give you a brief brief preview. We'll We'll have we'll consider a partition function for many many oscillators, different frequencies omega sub i, and we'll write down the partition function, and we'll be able to calculate mean energy and everything. And here we've done this w w for a collection of um, oscillator modes uh, that we label by i, and uh, and of course we could work this out. But what we really need to do is as we've done with uh, bosons and fermions is we need to consider a, a large cavity uh, and make our cavity so large that the levels become very very close together and so we can convert uh, our calculations to integral over appropriate density of states. So we're going to go through this whole process again where we're going to find an appropriate density of states and go and convert these to integrals and then we'll work out um, the results for our um, collection of photons or our collection of oscillators. Okay, so I'll see you in the next lecture.